Welcome to our Reversing on Plants podcast, where we talk all things about reversing type 2 diabetes with a plant-based diet. You're going to be joined by me, a registered dietitian who helps people reverse type 2 diabetes with plant-based eating, and also Galia, who is a health coach and a certified personal trainer who is passionate about helping people living with diabetes. So thank you so much for listening in, and let's get started. Hey, thank you so much for joining us on today's episode, and this is the Reversing on Plants podcast where we talk about all things to do with reversing type 2 diabetes and let us introduce ourselves if you don't know us already. My name is Charmaine and I am a registered dietitian who works with people living with diabetes to help them reverse insulin resistance and therefore reverse diabetes through a low-fat plant-based diet. My name is Galia. I am a health and fitness coach with a degree in biomedical science and I work alongside of Charmaine. I am here ready to support people through their journey while reversing on plants. In today's episode, we're going to talk about insulin resistance, which is a very interesting concept and topic. It's something that's not really spoken about a lot in the diabetic community, which is quite surprising when you look into more of what that is. So I have a couple of questions. Are you ready, Charmaine? Yes, I am. So the first one, and I think this is the best starting point for us here. So what is insulin resistance? Yeah, so insulin resistance is basically a phenomenon where your body isn't as responsive to insulin. So I like to use this analogy that Dr. Neil Bernard always uses. So insulin resistance, is like a lock and key. So think that your body cells are the lock and insulin is the key. So normally insulin's function is to bring the blood sugar from your blood from when you eat. Let's say if you eat a banana, it breaks down to glucose and it goes into your bloodstream. So your body wants to use that for energy. What insulin does, it's almost as a signal for your body cells to take in the glucose into your cells. And so when usually that happens, insulin needs insulin receptor. And so that the insulin receptor can signal the body cells to open up to get the glucose in so it can metabolize for energy. But what's happening with insulin resistance is kind of like when a kid sticks some chewing gum into the lock. And so normally the lock and key works perfectly, but when there's chewing gum in the lock, it doesn't work as well anymore. And so what the chewing gum is in this case is actually the buildup of fatty acids in your muscle cells and your body cells and your liver cells. So when there's a buildup of fatty acids in your cells, it actually inhibits or turn off the insulin receptors. So either that your body isn't responsive to insulin or it needs more insulin for it to be stimulated so that it can signal the body cells to open up for glucose. So what happens when the insulin receptors is inhibited, when there's chewing gum in the lock, what happens is that the insulin isn't able to open up the lock anymore. And so the glucose that is supposed to go into the cells doesn't go into the cells and it stays in the bloodstream. And that is what causes high blood glucose, which is the biggest symptom of type 2 diabetes. And so that's why a lot of times when people who are living with type 2 diabetes or even pre-diabetes or any kind of insulin resistance, they'll find that even eating a banana or eating a piece of bread, it shoots up their blood sugar because insulin resistance is present in their cells. And that's what is blocking the action of insulin and that prevents their body from regulating the glucose normally. I love this so much because it's really fascinating when you really take on board what insulin resistance is. It's crazy to think that it's not something that is more focused on when having conversations about diabetes, specifically type 2 diabetes, as that's the precursor to dysfunctional carbohydrate glucose metabolism. Even with type 1 diabetes, so I am type 1 diabetic, and it's not something that is spoken about. So the insulin resistance isn't the driving force in type 1 diabetes, but it can really aggravate the condition. So to not even have that be part of the conversation when it comes to type 1 is shocking, but more so, of course, type 2, because it's so much more prominent and prevalent in the type 2 diabetes kind of world. And when you look at the approach that you take in terms of management of the condition, it's really shocking that that is not taken on board enough. It blows my mind. Yeah, and people tend to focus on the symptom of high blood sugar. So to prevent high blood sugar, you need to cut out carbs, but they're not really focusing on the root cause, which is insulin resistance. And the root cause is the chewing gum, which is the fatty acids or just fat in general. 
So it's definitely really interesting and we do have a lot more to do in terms of focusing on root cause in Western medicine, I believe. Yeah, definitely. So if you were to give an explanation or share information with us about how insulin resistance affects someone living with type 2 diabetes, what does that timeline look like if you're starting with the development of insulin resistance? How does that progress? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. And a lot of times when I talk about type 2 diabetes, the root cause of type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. A lot of people think that, oh, like when you get type 2 diabetes, that's when you're insulin resistant. But you raised a really, really good question because research has shown that insulin resistance happens 10, 20 years before you're actually diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or even pre-diabetes. So it's definitely something that we do want to be more aware of. And it's not just for people that are living with diabetes, even people who have a family history of diabetes who are more at risk of having type 2 diabetes do have to pay attention to that. And the reason being the timeline is that, of course, everyone is different. But usually what happens is when someone, let's say if they eat a really high fat diet, and that usually even if they're skinny, I actually have a lot of people that I work with are skinny, but have type 2 diabetes, but they eat a really high fat diet, their muscle cells can also store fatty acids, their liver cells could also store fatty acids, even though they may not have a lot of fat cells. And so a lot of times what happens is that the fat actually builds up in your muscle cells and your liver cells and your body cells. And so someone becomes more and more insulin resistant as time goes by, if they eat a high fat diet or a sedentary lifestyle or some people that may be overweight and little by little, their body becomes less carbohydrate tolerant and they become less insulin sensitive. And so that's when insulin resistance slowly comes up. And again, the speed, everybody, is different and the speed, the progress, everybody is different, but that usually is what's happening. And so as your body is insulin resistant, then the blood sugar slowly comes up. And so it slowly progresses to pre-diabetes and it shows in your A1C or in your fasting blood sugar. And your doctor probably will tell you, hey, like, you know, there's pre-diabetes, you might want to be careful. And if that progresses, then your A1C might get to a diabetic level here in America. Our level is 6.4 A1C. If you're over that, then it puts you in the type 2 diabetes category. So that's usually how it progresses. I don't know if you want to add more on that. Yeah, I was going to say from what I've read and what I've studied, I think what's really fascinating is the power that a dietary lifestyle, a change in your dietary lifestyle, how important that can be. So research shows that dietary changes are effective at all levels of prevention. So if you're a very, very young person, if you're in your teens, and you adopt a a healthy lifestyle, you or healthy, so more whole foods, less processed foods, less refined sugars, that you decrease your risk of developing not just diabetes, but a lot of other problems and conditions in the future. So reducing your risk of heart disease, of cancer, of, of kidney disease. And you see that even in people who have already developed diabetes, so higher levels of prevention that as someone with diabetes, you can either put diabetes into remission, you can reverse insulin resistance, or you can reverse the complications you might have developed. So it's fascinating to see that there isn't more focus on those dietary changes as opposed to medicating. And as time passes and your insulin resistance is high, your body compensates by producing more insulin. And that increased insulin production is really detrimental to to the tissues of your body. So they are implicated in the development of the complications that you want to avoid. And then even beyond that. So it just, it keeps going. And over time, as the cells of the pancreas kind of burn out, they become tired from having to overcompensate Mm -hmm. producing insulin, people end up having to take on more and more medication. So supplementing themselves with exogenous insulin. And it's sad to see how that can snowball so quickly and how something so simple, like adopting a dietary change can have such a strong impact as well. Like for me, for myself, as someone who is type one, so I didn't become type one because of insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. It's an autoimmune condition, but I have gone through phases 
where I have been extremely insulin resistant. And that increases my risk as someone living with type one of complications, because it means I go through a lot more variability in my blood sugar levels, because it's harder for me to get my blood sugar levels down if I'm eating. So for me, taking that kind of a change on board as someone with type one has been really eye opening. And for the people that I know who are also type one, who have made similar life changes, it's really amazing to see how powerful that can be across the diabetic population. Yeah. And I want to add something to one thing that you mentioned. I love the, you know, primary prevention and the secondary and the tertiary interventions. I think it's interesting because I think a lot of times, especially when it comes to type 2 diabetes, a lot of people just focus on type 2 diabetes prevention, which is awesome. I think that is fantastic to focus on prevention if you can nip it in, but why not? But I think there is a very little emphasis on the secondary and tertiary reversal of type 2 diabetes, which there are scientific journals that do talk about diabetes reversal, which is super exciting, but it's not very popular and it's not very common to hear that. And I think that's definitely something that I could think can give a lot of people hope and can help people understand, okay, what is the root cause? If you're able to solve the root cause, then you'll be able to reverse the condition. And even as you mentioned, when your body is producing more and more insulin, it tires out the pancreatic cells. But what's amazing about lowering the blood sugar and what's amazing about whole foods plant-based diet is that not only does it help you lower the body fat in your cells, researchers have shown that once the body fat level lowers, it actually almost wakes up the beta cells in the pancreatic cells and they actually start producing insulin again, which is very, very interesting. And that's something that happens with people that do have some beta cells left, but that's something that I think it's really exciting once you know, okay, let's solve the root of problem, let's lower the amount of fat in the body, then not only does insulin resistance gets resolved, but also your pancreas health also improve as well. So just wanted to throw that in there as well. I love that. I love that so much. And something that's come to mind to me now is when people talk about insulin resistance and or insulin sensitivity, I think that's a lot more useful used than insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. But when people talk about, you know, insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity, something else that always comes into the conversation is exercise. And I was reading a couple of studies that looked at the effect of exercise as a means of tackling insulin resistance, improving insulin sensitivity compared to diet. And when it comes to exercise being a strategy to increase insulin sensitivity, it's extremely effective. Yes. But what research shows repeatedly repeatedly is that it's not an effective means to lower your HbA1c because exercise will make you more insulin sensitive in that period where you're exercising. It doesn't mean that your insulin sensitivity at baseline is high, meaning your insulin resistance at a baseline is low. It just means after those episodes, after those moments where you are physically active, where you are exercising, your body's insulin sensitivity will increase in the hours after that. And that's not necessarily reflected in HbA1c. So I'm as someone who loves fitness, I definitely support exercise as being a component of healthy lifestyle. But in terms of getting out of a quote unquote diabetic range in exercise alone, isn't necessarily the most effective strategy for that. You have to have the dietary lifestyle component feeding in there. I just wanted to share that because I think that's really fascinating. And it's something people say a lot of the time when you ask them, what have you tried before to improve your diabetic health, to reverse insulin resistance? One of the things you hear most commonly is either medication or exercise and medication isn't going to reverse your condition and exercise alone is not the most effective strategy so I just think that's really interesting <laughs> yeah that is actually really interesting and it's funny because as a dietitian we help a lot of people lose weight as well and a lot of times in weight loss people say it's mostly diet and maybe like 30 percent of exercise and I totally believe it's really helpful to exercise and it's interesting what you said about it only helps you improve the insulin sensitivity while you exercise. And so I think it also goes back to the idea that, okay, like what is the root cause? We do have a lot of people coming in and saying, yeah, we have, I have a really active lifestyle, but my A1C is still 6.7 or 6.8. And once they change their diet, they're actually able to bring them down while their exercise routine still stays the same. So I definitely think that it's almost like airplane. You can't fly with just one wing. You have to fly with both wings.
everything. So I definitely think that it's, it's a very important component as well. So thank you so much for bringing that up. I love it. Of course, of course. I agree with you in terms of as when you learn about fitness and exercise, there's such a strong focus on diet because at the end of the day, it's calorie balance. In terms of somebody losing weight, not talking about nutrition specifically, because someone can lose weight and not necessarily have a healthy diet. But in terms of maximizing weight loss, it's essentially a balancing equation. So I think that's something really important to kind of flag there. Next question. So we've kind of touched on it before in this conversation. Question is, can insulin resistance be reversed? And if so, how? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So how to reverse insulin resistance? And there's actually a lot of controversy around this, especially in the diabetics world, because a lot of people believe carbs is the root cause of insulin resistance because carbs turn into fat and fat builds up in the insulin resistance. And that's one thing first that I want to clear up because a lot of people think that carbs is easy to turn into fat and fat is not easy to turn into fat. When you really think about it, it doesn't make sense. And in your body's physiology, it actually takes your body more work to turn carbs into fat. And it's easier for your body to turn fat into fat. And why I say this is because your body actually needs 30% of the calories from the carbs that you eat to turn it into fat, but it only needs 3% of the calories from fat that you eat to turn into fat. So it's way more efficient for your body to turn the fat that you eat into the fat that you store. I just wanted to clear that up because a lot of people, and I get a lot of comments on TikTok saying that, no, it's carbs or it's something else. It's not fat, but hundreds of years of research have shown that a high fat diet or just the relationship between fat and insulin resistance is there. And a high fat diet usually is the biggest contributor to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So I just wanted to clear that up. So in order to reverse insulin resistance, what you want to do is actually lower the fat intake that you're eating. And the best way to do so is through a whole foods plant-based diet. And the reason why I say this is because with a whole foods plant-based diet, not only is most foods low in fat, they are also high in fiber. And what fiber does is that there's two different kinds of fiber. There's insoluble fiber and there is soluble fiber. And these fibers actually help decrease fat absorption. They actually help decrease the cholesterol in your body. And that helps you improve your lipid profile in your blood. And so a whole foods plant-based diet is really ideal for reversing insulin resistance in a way where you don't have to restrict your carbs. You don't have to restrict your portions because these foods are generally lower in calorie density. And it's more so really choosing the right foods rather than counting carbs, counting calories, or restricting your portion. Does that make sense? <laughs> Does that make yeah, sense? 100%. And I think also in terms of one of the biggest concerns I think people have when it comes to picking a quote unquote diet, I don't really like that word, but mm -hmm. pattern of eating. <laughs> I think it's really a whole foods plant-based diet is essentially the only diet that is shown to reduce risk of complications or certain diseases throughout your lifespan. Mm -hmm. It's also one of the, what I think, easiest diets to adopt because of what you've said in terms of the people who want to watch their weight or have aesthetic goals, speaking more to fitness and that side of health, it's easiest to maintain your weight with a diet like that. And personally, as someone with type one, I don't feel like it's restrictive. And I think that's something that people have so many concerns with. I think what's restrictive is trying to force yourself to not eat carbs mm -hmm. when your body is so designed mm -hmm. to run on, on that source of energy. For me, that's something that really stands out. Yeah, and I love what you shared too because I think a lot of times people think it's restrictive because their diet is mostly composed of food that is high in fat, that is high in animal protein. But a lot of times when it comes to transitioning, it's really about switching foods and still having your familiar foods. You can still have pasta, you can still have tacos, you can still have the foods that you're familiar with. And it's really about switching it. And a lot of times, just to continue what I was sharing about the whole foods plant based diet is that a lot of times when you start on this lifestyle, maybe in the first few days, when you start in this lifestyle, your blood sugar may be a little bit higher, because you're still reversing insulin resistance, or you're used to a low carb lifestyle or generally lower in carbohydrate lifestyle. But it's really amazing, because your body gets used to it. And it doesn't 
take a long time for your body to start reversing insulin resistance and start lowering your blood sugar. So I think that is definitely something that's really exciting. And like you said, whole foods plant-based diet is one of the healthiest diet that can lower your risk of all of the different diseases, including cancer, including the risk of heart disease, the risk of kidney disease or liver disease. It helps with everything and it's not just a diet for one thing. And so I think this is definitely exciting to share with people and to let people understand that it's a lot of benefits. And if they just give it a try, why not? Like you only live once, why not give it a try? So thank you for sharing what you shared. Yeah, of course. And one of the things that for me, this was a moment where things really clicked. When I was in the process about learning about insulin resistance and learning about diet and really doing my research on what it was that I wanted to do for myself. And I understand the position that people are in when they're researching and they're trying to figure out what diet they want to do or what they should do next. And it can be extremely, extremely overwhelming. But the thing that for me really hit at home, according to Diabetes UK, I think the statistic is that people living with diabetes have a three times higher chance of heart disease than people who are not living with diabetes. And that's kind of an umbrella for diabetes as a whole. It doesn't really distinguish between type one and type two, which for me, I feel like there should be a bit more of a distinction there. But that's the statistic. Mm -hmm. And that statistic is there that exists. And then there is ample research that points to high fat diets, diets that are high in saturated fat, increasing your risk of heart disease and of cardiac events. And you combine the two through, for example, a ketogenic diet, you combine the two and you're somebody who already has an increased risk of heart disease, of having a stroke, any cardiac event. And then you factor in a diet that further increases that risk. For me, when I see that, I purely see a ketogenic diet as a very short-term approach. People are not thinking about the long-term risk that they might be exposing themselves to. And the problem is, and please do add in if you'd like, for me, what I see as being scary is that there aren't really any big studies that look at the long-term complications of a ketogenic diet and a ketogenic diet in the diabetic population specifically. So you have tons of people adopting this diet, tons of people living with diabetes adopting this diet, and we don't know for sure how this affects your risk. For me, that's a really scary thing. And I feel like that needs to be put out there more. And I know it makes people upset and that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen every now and again when you're sharing, when you have strong opinions, when you're passionate about something, people aren't always going to react how you would like them to or how you feel people should and that's perfectly fine I understand that but I feel that's really something that I want to emphasize to people especially someone who does live with diabetes so I understand like the fear of complications moving towards the future as I get older and in my mind if I can do anything to minimize that I will do it and the diet that is shown to reduce risk of, for example, people who've already had a cardiac event or have heart disease, either tackle heart disease or reduce your risk of a secondary cardiac event. The most effective diet is a vegan, whole food, plant-based diet that is low in fat. So for me, that's a really take home point. I don't know if you feel the same about me, but yeah, definitely. What you shared there was just tremendous. And I wish everyone can hear that, <laughs> but I'm glad that we're recording this because this is going on our podcast, but I think that's tremendous because I think a lot of times to it I mean as me I'm kind of a person that throws myself out there on social media and I just share about whole foods plant-based lifestyle and I get a lot of backlash with no like keto is the way and there's a part of me that just gets scared of like oh like I don't want to just step on people's toes like I don't want to get those hate comments like I, I don't but when I got on this call with this lady and she was just sharing that she's almost going to go on dialysis and she was just sharing that yes like I've tried a lot of different things before I've tried keto before and my blood sugar lowered but there's other things that were still a problem like her kidney function and I get a lot of people telling me that it actually a lot of clients that I have they share with me that their cholesterol level goes up their triglycerides goes up when they are on the ketogenic lifestyle and it saddens me 
because if you look at meta-analysis research, if you look at systematic reviews, they all point to a whole foods plant-based lifestyle and not a low-carb lifestyle. In fact, there is actually meta-analysis that shows a low-carb lifestyle. It actually increases the mortality rate of people that are on a low-carb lifestyle, which is very interesting, especially for people who are living with diabetes. They don't just deal with heart disease. They also deal with risks of cancer and the risk of compromised kidney function. And so when you push a high animal protein, a very high fat acidic diet to people, it actually worsens their kidney functions and it saddens me. And that call with that lady just reminds me why I'm sharing what I'm sharing and just why I'm pushing the truth out there. And I'm not afraid to say this is the truth and definitely believe that it's important for people to understand not just the short term, oh, right, great, you lower your blood sugar, but more so the bigger picture of how it affects your health overall. So thank you so much for bringing that up because I definitely think that it's good to share. I think people need to know this. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you as well for putting yourself out there all the time on social media and having these kind of conversations. And as you said, I think it's so important that we do. And if you're not making some people uncomfortable or some people question, I don't think we're being as honest as we should be. So I think it naturally, we're always gonna, there's always gonna be someone who's unhappy, someone who disagrees, but there's also gonna be people that are open to the information and it can positively impact them. And so I think it's better for, in general, to focus on that positive, potential positive impact that you can have on somebody, as opposed to people who are going to send hateful messages or or whatever people do. And to go on about what you said about the client that you spoke to, say, talking about her kidneys, that is one of the biggest fears in, in the diabetic community is complications with their organs and specifically the kidneys. And diabetes is irregular blood sugars. The roller coaster of your blood sugars is so harsh on your kidneys. And when you factor in how many years you could be living with diabetes, whether it be type one or type two, and how harsh that can be on your kidneys, and then you put your kidneys through the strain of diet that it's not really equipped to process, Mm -hmm. to filter, that's something that I also feel is needs to be spoken about and kind of needs to be touched on because the complications that's one of the things that drives people in the first place to make a change when it comes to how they approach diabetes it's the fear of these complications and the fear can be so real and that's why I think it's so important to as I said before to put that information out there to try and make it a bit easier for you to potentially make a choice when it comes to how you want to approach things moving forward and to not focus on things that you've tried in the past and the frustration but to just really go in with an open mind and be like, this is what the research says, what the science says, this works just flat out. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing that as well. I think it's something really important to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Okay, awesome. To go on with some of our last questions, we have two questions left. So Mm -hmm. next one is, what is the biggest mistake you see people make when it comes to reversing insulin resistance? Yeah, so I think the biggest mistake mistake that people make well it depends on where they are if they don't know about a whole foods plant based lifestyle if they don't know anything about like fat and insulin resistance then i would say the biggest mistake that they do is actually turn to low carb foods like nuts cheese or meat just a low-key ketogenic lifestyle and what that does is actually it does the opposite when you lower your carb intake and you aim for low carb foods yes it doesn't give your body carbohydrates to turn it into blood sugar to raise your blood sugar and that may be a stabilized blood sugar in the beginning however that actually increased your body's um, insulin resistance and actually increases the fat in your body and even though if you may be losing weight if you're like oh yeah i lost like 10 pounds just by cutting carbs out usually either that's water weight that you're losing or even if you're losing weight you're not necessarily losing the fat uh, in your liver cells and your muscle cells and so that's one thing that i want people to recognize as well and also for people that are familiar with the whole foods plant-based lifestyle or just has some idea about the whole foods plant-based lifestyle the biggest mistake that i see people make even if they cut out meat is still not eating enough carbohydrates because they're scared of fruits because they're scared of starches or whole grains and what it does is usually i see people before they come to me they're just drinking celery juice or they just eat plain salad for their lunch 
much, um, not even with beans because beans have carbohydrates. And what that does is not only it doesn't give you energy, you may be starving and it may backfire because you'll be so hungry and so miserable that you're like, oh, like this it doesn't work and you go back to the way that you were eating. So I think it's very important to know what to eat. And also it's very important to know that you don't have to be scared of the healthy natural carbohydrates. I love that. I love that so much. And I think that distinction, learning to make that distinction between the types of fat and what you're losing, what you're getting rid of. So the visceral fat, like the fat that you can see on your body versus the fat in your cells are two very, very different things. And as you said earlier, you can have insulin resistance and be have a healthy BMI. So I think that distinction is so, so, so important. And it's not something that people know to make. And people don't publicly make either. So it's really hard to kind of find that little golden nugget of information. And I just think it's so important. So thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So last question is, what is the best advice you can give to somebody who is trying to reverse diabetes or reverse insulin resistance? I would say to focus on the root cause. I know I can give a lot of advice because that's what I do. But I would say that that's the biggest thing that I would say is try to focus on the root cause. Cause, and I think people should not only do that in diabetes, but in other disease prevention or reversal. Because if you don't let, look at the root cause, if you only look at the symptoms, it'll be a vicious cycle. And that's why people don't think that you can reverse diabetes because not a lot of people focus on the root cause of the problem. And so that would be my biggest advice is look at insulin resistance. And also another advice that I would say is just do it. I know it's so cheesy, but just try it. Try it for 10 days. Try it for a week or try for a month. Try for three months. You have the rest of your life that you can choose to do with it, whatever, but just do it to see the benefits of a whole food spot based lifestyle and to see how much more you can achieve with this lifestyle, your energy that's going to come back and all the great things that is going to come with it. So yeah, I would say just give it a go. I love that. And I totally agree with both points that you make obviously Mm -hmm. focusing on the root cause but just giving it a try like at the end of the day you really have nothing to lose and you could worst worst case scenario if you're trying something you feel it doesn't work Mm -hmm. best case scenario it works and you're pleasantly surprised Mm -hmm. and you start to move forward in a new and exciting direction Mm -hmm. so I totally love that I would add as well to people and as a coach this is something that I think is so vital but to keep track of what you are trying because even if you don't necessarily have somebody to guide you, you yourself will feel motivated by tracking it yourself, by being able to look back and see progress that you're making, whether it be weight loss or your blood sugars or any other goals that you have in mind. Being able to have those little victories when you're journaling, they really help you be able to move forward. And I think that's so important, especially in the early phases, because right. what is it? It's like it takes 20 days to break a habit. I don't know. If that's a saying you've had before. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, um, it takes 20 days, for example, of journaling, of trying mm-hmm. something new. And then it no longer feels like a chore or something you actively have to think about or work towards so aggressively. It comes a lot more naturally. So I think the journaling is really, really helpful for people. And it's something I would definitely encourage anyone to try do when you're trying to make a change. Yes, yes. I love it. I journal every day and I tell all my clients to make sure you journal because I think a lot of times people underestimate the power of our mind. Everything that we do comes from a mind and not just comes from our hands or action. Like it comes from our mind. And so it's very important to just journal, journal your why, why you're doing this. How do you want to see your life? How do you want to visualize your life and realize your life? So Um, I definitely think that's a really fantastic tip that you shared there, Galia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've come to the end of the podcast and I really enjoyed our conversation today, Galia. And I hope that our listeners will learn more about insulin resistance and the cause of it and how to reverse it as well. And if you guys have any questions or any ideas, anything that you want us to share on this podcast, do let us know. You can either DM us on Instagram or send us a 
a message over Facebook as well. You can always reach out to us with whatever ideas that you have. And you can follow me on Reversing on Plants at TikTok or Instagram. And Galia, how do people follow you? Yeah, so I'm on Instagram as at type 101 with Galia. That's currently my only platform, but I'm usually really good with answering messages and stuff. So please do reach out if you have any suggestions, anything that you want to share, any questions, anything at all. Amazing. So we will see you guys next time on the Reversing on Plants podcast, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for listening in to this podcast. I appreciate your time and your attention. If you want to have more resources in reversing diabetes with a plant-based diet, there is a free course. You can find them in the description or in the show link, and you can also follow me at Reversing on plants on TikTok or Instagram and subscribe to my channel on YouTube as well. Or if you would like to work with me one-on-one, then you can book a call with my team to see if you're a great fit and get started on this journey of reversing type 2 diabetes. Have a great day and we will talk to you soon. Have a good one.